Okay, uh, I welcome all of you and uh, I'm sure we'll have a few more who will join us in a moment. Um, this is a common, a joint session of the two colloquia, the Oberseminar of my colleague Karen Nicholson and myself, History of Science and uh, Jewish History and Culture. And um, I know we have a lot of our participants of the Oberseminar, but we also have members of our Freundeskreis, of the Friends of the Chair for Jewish History, and uh, of course, colleagues. I'm really happy to see at least uh, your faces on the screen for this event today. Let me just start by saying that this will be recorded, um, but uh, as I was promised, only the speakers will be seen on the recorded version. So if you can keep your cameras on, we would like to see your faces, uh, but you won't be seen um, in the recording. Um, I should also uh, remember, uh, remind you, that uh, you uh, will be on silent uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, and after the lecture, of course, everyone will have a chance to ask questions and will be in a conversation. Uh, it is now my real pleasure on behalf of myself and my colleague, Karen Nicholson, uh, to welcome our speaker, Alon Tal. Uh, Professor Tal, um, who I had the honor of hosting before at American University in, in uh, Washington is probably the leading Israeli environmentalist, environmental activist. He is the founder of so many organizations, the Israel Union for Environmental Defense, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, uh, of Ecopeace, Friends of the Earth, uh, Middle East, and also the Green party in Israel. Well, it's not as successful as in Germany, I should say, uh, but at least I think he gave it a good try. Uh, and hopefully the ideas uh, will influence other movements and parties as well. Um, he is actually still active in political life. He was running for the last Knesset election uh, as well on the list of uh, Benny Gantz, I think, uh, kind of closely didn't make it into the Knesset, but maybe there will be soon elections again. Who knows? Oh, no, no, there, there, there will be some shaking up, but I, you'll see. Give us a week or two. Okay, okay. I, I, maybe that's another thing we should talk about as well. I'd be very curious about that. But I would just, uh, to end my very brief introduction, I just want to say, of course, we invited him also as an environmental activist, but also uh, as an academic. Uh, he who has uh, published uh, a number of important uh, books and articles, who is a professor at Tel Aviv University, was chair of the Department of Public Policy at Tel Aviv University. Um, among the books, I want just to mention a, his book on pollution, Pollution in the Promised Land, an Environmental History of Israel. Uh, a book on the trees called All the Trees of the Forest, Israel's Woodlands from the Antiquity to the Present, and the book we will discuss uh, today in more detail, um, The Land is Full, Addressing Overpopulation in Israel, uh, which uh, came out with, new, with uh, Yale University Press. In my opinion, it is the most important problem, the most important not much discussed problem Israel is facing. Uh, and why that is the case, I think we will hear from Professor Tal now. Um, Alon, are you ready? Good to go, yes. So first of all, I wanna thank uh, Karen and, and Michael for inviting me to join them and you all for taking time off to hear about uh, uh, a challenge that Israel faces and has not yet uh, addressed, but we hope to soon. Um, just a, an aside, in a previous book I wrote called uh, Speaking of Earth, I looked at the great speeches of the great environmentalists around the world, and if I could explain, had one reason why the Israeli Green Party didn't take off as it did in Germany is because Petra Kelly never had Israeli citizenship, and if you 
Uh, if we had been lucky to have somebody like her to lead the forces, we would have done better. But um, I see some people who remember Petra Kelly uh, smiling. Anyway, um, but she certainly wrote a lot that can inspire us today. I'm delighted to talk to you about the problem, that, as Michael said, which is probably Israel, I think, most pressing existential challenge, which is the least discussed. For many years, I ran environmental NGOs and I sued anything that moved, the government, polluting factories, you name it. At some point, I realized that I was dealing with symptoms and not with causes, and that if Israeli uh, demography continued to explode the way it is at a 2% growth per year, we weren't going to get very far. So I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes. Hopefully, I'll be very provocative. And then at some point, we will um, take a break. And, uh, and I will hear what I hope will be questions, opinions, and, and ideas. And uh, we'll get started. So bear with me as we move to the to PowerPoint. OK. So wherever we go in this uh, discussion, uh, I won't be too far from this book, The Land is Full. The, the English version came out with Yale University Press. There's a Hebrew version. I always say it's it's the best solution for insomnia. So if you can't fall asleep at night, three or four pages of this, any of my other books will do the job. And it, it has uh, health benefits, even if not necessarily environmental one. We know that the world's population is growing. If we go back 200,000 years ago, the first things that resume in, uh, resembled uh, humans walked to Earth, but it took about 200,000 years to get to a billion. That happened in 1803. Another century goes by and we get to 2 billion people, and then things started to speed up a lot. Now about every 15 years we add a billion people to the planet. Uh, that's the, the big global picture because when we talk about the environment, we want to think globally and act locally. And this brings me to the first takeaway point, which will be so important as we consider Israel's situation. And that is the concept of population momentum. When you are facing a rapidly geometrically increasing uh, population growth function, uh, it, you can't really turn it off. It's not like when you sue a polluter for air pollution, you can say, okay, let's put a new filter on that or we'll reduce some of the polluting inputs. No, it takes two to three generations before a population stabilizes. The best example I have of this would be uh, China, which in uh, 1979, Deng Xiaoping introduced the one child policy, a terrible policy that violated human rights and had all kinds of flaws to it, but he felt he had no choice then. But how long did it take for the one child policy to stabilize China's population? And that is, of course, a trick question because population in China continues to grow and will until about 2030, because like the graph says, it takes about two to three generations. And so that even if Israel and other countries like Israel that are growing so quickly just put on the brakes and move to a replacement 2.1 child population fertility levels, it would take a long time. And quite frankly, I don't think our leadership has quite the persuasive power of the Communist Party of China. So when we look at what's happening in the world, before we go to Israel, every year the United Nations puts out, the, the every two years they put out a, a, uh, a projection. And this is the most recent one. We'll get another one this uh, summer, presumably in July. But you can see that we are spiraling forward to a world in which there's probably going to be 11 billion people by the end of the century. And some of you younger students may get there. Okay, uh, the higher projection, of course, is, is uh, hard to imagine something over 16 billion people, more than twice of what we have now, if, if uh, things don't change. And uh, if we look at what this means, if we break it down by areas, uh, I always uh, have trouble sleeping at night because of the second column. You can see Europe is going to um, shrink a little bit when it gets after it reaches its peak. Um, but it's really Africa that had 200 million people in 1950, and it's gonna be over 4 billion people today, uh, the most crowded, um, place in the world will be then already it's a continent that has trouble feeding itself the most violent continent and of course it's israel is the only western company country that you can walk to from africa as many people have and so uh, it's something we need to think about when we think about uh, our our commitment to assisting africans to become a, a better place to live that uh, with these population trends things are going to be much much harder to do and this isn't just some sort of malthusian uh, you know alarmism uh, the World Health Organization reminds us that his hunger is still the number one cause of death. Indeed, in the last 10 years, 100 million people died of hunger. So maybe Malthus wasn't so far out when he talked about the, the great concern about this. And it's not just people who, have a, uh, who are suffering from overpopulation. I believe it's also animals. There's a basic axiom, more people, less nature. So the World Wildlife Fund comes out with its living planet 
uh, index. And indeed, we saw that in the last uh, 45 years, 60% of the animals, not species, but just the overall populations have disappeared on our watch on the planet. So that's sort of the global, the big picture. And as we zoom in on Israel, we see that Israel has very much a similar population a pattern to that of the world. We started with about a million people in 1950 after the last survivors of the Holocaust came over. We brought them over rather quickly. And in 1960, we had 2 million people, 1973 million. And you can do the math up to 9.3 million people today, okay? So that's about a, about a uh, you know, 10, 10 fold increase. But the difference is, is that during the earlier decades, 60, 70, 80, we grew at 1 million people every 10 years, and now we grow at 1.5 million, and that's to be expected when you have a geometric function that grows more and more and more over time. And that means that Israel, which is already very crowded, and you can see us compared to the other crowded OECD countries, is going to become far more crowded. And this is, of course, with our Negev Desert, the southern part of Israel, 60% of the land only has 7% of the population. If we were to take out this part and just look at the country, by far we're approaching levels of density comparable to Bangladesh, okay? And that is for a very simple reason. People in Israel have a lot of children. When you look at the fertility rates of the OECD, you can see here, almost, it's not a, Apple sort of massacred the, the graphics here, but you can see that the average woman in Israel has 3.1 children, where the OECD average is almost half that, okay? So, so um, something is going on in our country, which is different than the rest of that, and it's not uh, everybody. You can see that there's different um, fertility patterns. One of the things we've seen, for example, is that the Arab Israeli population, which used to have 8.5 children per family, uh, per, per woman, it used to be the highest in the world, have dropped down. Last year, for the first time, Muslim women had fewer children per capita than Jewish women did. Um, but something's happening there. I would also uh, introduce the notion that Israel lives in a neighborhood, hopefully one will be more and more integrated into, and um, Jordan, in 1949, Jordan attacked the young state of Israel. They had 500,000 people then. But since that time, they have been the demographic champions. They've been taking in immigrants, first Palestinian refugees, then Iraqi, over a million, now over 2 million Syrians. Here's a figure. And these are the numbers, are up to over 10 million people today from 500,000. So if Israel grew tenfold, Jordan grew 20-fold, or 2,000%. Now, um, Egypt also, every year, 2 million more mouths to feed, 2 million more people to provide jobs for. The population rate dropped briefly, but it's now even higher than Israel. Um, Palestinian population, Palestine has also grown dramatically uh, over the many years. So we can see that this is a region we live in which has the same resource base, which is facing more and more crowded conditions. And what does this mean environmentally? Well, it's bad news. It means that we have collapse of our ecosystems and increased um, emissions of, of greenhouse gases. And we have more and more trash, noise pollution. The number one uh, uh, reason, one out of every three complaints to the police is that Israelis are getting annoyed by their neighbors that make so much noise. But as the country becomes more and more crowded, that becomes it. Although we do have a fairly remarkable system of desalination. Here's a picture of the first major desalination plant in, in Ashkelon. So we take seawater and convert it into fresh water. So we don't have some of the shortages we had in the past. Nonetheless, uh, this makes us very, very vulnerable, not only to the price of energy, but also the fact that we live in a, a somewhat hostile neighborhood. And as the um, terrorist groups in, in Gaza and the Hezbollah in, in Lebanon target Israel, uh, we already know that they have, just like I can show you on Google Maps, where the five desal plants in Israel, soon to be seven, they know exactly where they are too, and they, and they would like very much to take them out. Now, uh, just sort of to, to broaden on these things, um, Israel is blessed with astonishing biodiversity. 115 uh, mammal species in a country so small, remember Israel only 22,000 square kilometers, and we have more bat species in Israel than all of Europe, okay? Um, just amazing as three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe converge to produce this incredible um, rich, mosaic of, of life. You compare it to California, which is 14 times bigger than us, all theories of island geography would say that we would have to have far lower biodiversity. And yet it's kind of comparable. 
And that has to do with our incredible rain gradient letter. But the problem is, is that over the years, you can see here the red book, the book that catalogs all of the um, species that are endangered or disappeared. There's a global one that the IUCN puts out, but the Israeli one is getting bigger and bigger. And essentially about half of our mammals are going extinct. And here's the story, as you can see, the, the beautiful wildflowers giving way to new houses. Every year, we need to produce 60,000 new housing units just to stay in place. And although we can try to make our cities more dense, it's much easier for planners to, to take out the forests because the trees don't have a voice. Although I try very hard to speak for them when I'm on the board of the, the floor, but it's very difficult when people are looking for places to live, okay? So you can see the steady loss in open spaces that we see over the years. This is the more recent one. We went from 10 square kilometers of lost open space per year. Now we're up to about 21. And that'll continue to grow because that's the second takeaway point you have to think about is that the damage function from demographic pressures is not linear. It is linear for a while. You know, it's like driving on a highway and you're kind of crawling along 30 or 40 kilometer in traffic and all of a sudden the big soccer game lets out. Not, we, we used to have that before the, the COVID. So, and then all of a sudden another 5,000 cars go on the highway, nobody moves for an hour, okay? Because you've exceeded a, um, a physical threshold, okay? And we all see this happening. I think that's what we're starting to see here in terms of open spaces. We've used up the low hanging fruit, the easy places. And this is what it means for a country like Israel. You have here a picture of the Sea of Galilee, okay? And we, by the next 30 years, our organization, we created a organization, like I said, called Safuf, it means crowded. Um, looks at these issues of population and sustainability. We imagine there'll be a land loss comparable in size four times the, the Kinaris. We use this to explain to people that this is already really changing the landscape. Now, climate change is a very real reality in Israel. Uh, the Mediterranean region as a whole is a hot spot. We're now two degrees warmer than we were 20 years ago. Our, the fires are uh, happening more frequently as our other ones. And you'd expect that we would have a very, very vigilant and committed climate change policy here. And indeed, uh, in Paris, our prime minister went and made a pledge like all the other nations to reduce our emissions. But what did he say? He said, we're gonna reduce our emissions 26% below, below 2005 levels, levels by the year 2030. That sounds fantastic. At the time, it was more than other ones, except for one small caveat per capita. So when you are growing at 2% a year and you reduce your thing over a period of time, 25 years, 26%, you're growing by 47%. It's just like um, somebody who's trying to run on a treadmill. You're cutting back, but you keep going backwards. And so you can compare our actual emissions uh, to what, if we use the 2005 baseline, this is the 2015 one, to where the other OEC nations are, and they're really cutting back because their populations are stable. Per capita cuts in Israel may be even greater than many of these countries. But like I said, Israel's anomalous. And as a result of that, it becomes very, very difficult to be a good player in the global effort to stop it. The same is true of our garbage in the sea and goes on and on and on. I wanna say a word or two about the social impacts of being a country that's growing so quickly. And I share with you the well-known analogy or the fable of the six blind Indian men who approach a elephant and one touches the ear and says, oh, this is a fan. The other one grabs the tail and says, oh, this must be a vine. The other one touches the the um, Tuscan says this is a spear. Anyway, six blind people see six totally different things when they touch the elephant. And when I look at all the social problems of Israel, the elephant in the room that is the same as all of them is overpopulation. Um, and I see I'm having a bit of problem with my projector. So I'm gonna go here and um, have to make some changes. Just give me a second here. Okay, this should uh, do better. Thank you for your patience. So um, when I think about the social problems in Israel, well, let's talk about our health system. Israel has wonderful longevity. Men in Israel, I don't know how, but we live after Japanese men, I think more than and longer than anybody else in the world. We have wonderfully trained doctors, but we can see now as our hospitals get more and more crowded, that the level of service is starting to drop. We have the oldest doctors in the world because we can't let them retire because we don't have enough. We can't train them fast enough. Like I said, you'd have to increase the number of hospital rooms, 2% a year. The same is true of our classrooms, the most crowded junior high schools 
and uh, kindergartens the OECD and the other schools are very, very crowded. We all know that crowded classrooms are, are um, aggressive places, sometimes violent places. In a good case, a teacher can be a police person. They can't really be an educator when you're dealing with 40, 43 kids. And that's what my daughters went through all the way until they got to high school. It's amazing that we have children who can even read. Um, affordable housing, housing prices in Israel. They're not quite at Berlin levels, but we're all gonna get there soon. And um, that's because it's supply and demand. You cannot uh, produce enough houses to, and so therefore we, we know that traffic congestion. If you've ever come to Israel, um, you know that we have some traffic problems, but the Ministry of Environment report recently says it's gonna get worse. We're gonna be up to about uh, and more additional hour every day for commuters. And uh, commuters who are locked in traffic are frustrated people. The men tend to be more given to domestic abuse. We know that statistically because it just makes you crazy to be stuck in traffic. Um, one of my character flaws, in addition to being a professor, I'm a lawyer. Like you said, I used to sue polluters for a living. And uh, it takes, I'm now uh, involved in the largest class action suit against a polluter. And, the, and the, the realistic estimate to get a court decision after we have to go with the appeal, five years if we're lucky. But that's the average. Could be seven or eight if we're on the bad side of that average. So there are more and more there. And food security is also an issue, which we can talk about more later. But here's the, the, the Ministry of Environment study about transportation. You can see the number of beds per capita going down from when 1948, the British left us with three per thousand. And now we're down below uh, two. The amount of time uh, you can see is dropping down there. Um, the amount of time it takes to wait for medical services. All of these are different. Um, the doctors, it doesn't matter if it's the neurologist, we have, used to have to wait 10 days in 2010, and now you have to wait 32 days. We can see a system which is not responding. And the last point I'd make is maybe the most important one. This graph shows per capita income that we looked at based on the number of children. So in Israel, we have large families in certain sectors, and those families tend to be very, very poor. And it's a no-brainer. On average, a family with one or two kids has a monthly income per capita, which is pretty good. But once you cross into the five, six, seven, eight, and sometimes 14 kids, it's a basic division problem. More mouths to feed on the same salary, even with all the trial help the government gives, and we have more uh, there. Now, it would be a, inappropriate to give a talk in today's day and age without mentioning the connection between crowding and COVID because it's a serious one. I'll just run through a couple slides here to give you that we know it's zoonotic origins. There's been epidemics all over the years. The difference is that epidemics around the world are increasing all the time. And that's because people are becoming more and more connected to nature. Nature involuntarily is being violated. And again, it's happening mostly in these Southern regions. Take a look at China, okay? Wuhan, today has 11 million people. It only had 2.5 million people in 1985. But as that massive, rural urban migration, 200 million Chinese moving to the uh, cities have created massive loss of wildlife and the animals have no place to go. Here you can see the massive loss in Hebei around, around Wuhan where the problems. So I'm looking at my own town of Modi'in. We have this magnificent ecological corridor which uh, is home to great um, relics of, this is where the Maccabees, the people who fought the, the Greeks for freedom lived, and also animals. We have four hyenas. I go jogging there. I don't see hyenas so much, but they sometimes wander through our streets. Amazing biodiversity. But we shouldn't be seeing them on our streets the way we are, because we can see the danger associated with this. Now, the, that's the first aspect, but the real problem is the crowdedness. We all have become epidemiologists in the last year, and the are not or the reproduction number is something we all know, okay? And we know that there's uh, the number of cases on average that an infected person will cause. That's what the R-naught is. And in fact, COVID is a pretty low one and measles is a much, much more powerful one you can see here. But these are numbers that are not real. These are averages. In fact, we know it's always a range, okay? Which will tell you usually like, for example, measles is between 12 and 18, it's not 15. And what is the range based on? Well, there's four factors. And some of that has to do with the way that the the germ operates, the, the virus operates. For example, the r naught will vary uh, depending on how powerful it is or how long it takes to incubate 
or is it transmitted? AIDS is transmitted sexually. It's harder to do than when you breathe on somebody. But the one that we can control that's not part of the actual uh, biology of the virus is it varies from population to population. And Israel is a good case of this study, okay? We did a study in our big journal, Ecology and Environment. We looked at the most crowded cities in Israel and saw that they were always to be the ones where they had more infections. And then people said, well, maybe that has to do with the ultra-Orthodox population because they have uh, cultural norms. They refuse to maybe go into lockdowns as much. So then we took all the ultra-Orthodox communities in Israel and we saw, lo and behold, sure enough, those that were more crowded, B'nai Brak is our most crowded city. It's more crowded even than Gaza Strip. And that's where you had the highest infection rates. And so it, it, it's a problem. Now, I want to say that there's a problem with making the case about overpopulation in Israel for a few reasons. One is that people say, look, the Jewish people lost a third of their numbers between 1938 and 1945. And so we have a moral responsibility to replace those people and, and nobody should tell us we shouldn't have more children. And, and I would say that position is legitimate uh, historically. But the thing is, is that over the last 75 years, there has been a, an amazing explosion amongst Jews everywhere. There are 7 million people who identify as Jewish in the United States. We have over 7 million in Israel. If you start counting up the numbers, there were 16.5 million Jews in 1938 in the world, only 11 uh, million in 1945, tragically. But today we're back to 16, 17 million. And I already told you that the numbers are gonna double over the next 30 years, because that's population to momentum. So maybe having fulfilled our solemn need to replace the population, it's time to stop and think about whether it makes sense to continue growing so quickly in Israel with such a small land mass. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. The second point is the concern of Israelis. They say, well, how can you talk about this? Because we are in the midst of a demographic war with Arabs who've constantly said, if we can't beat the Jews on the battlefield, We'll beat them in the bedroom. We'll have more kids than them. And this was literally the rhetoric of uh, Palestinian politicians for years. The famous quote by Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader, was the secret weapon of the Palestinian people is the womb of the Arab mother. So this created the sort of race to the bottom where everybody's having more and more kids to see if they can defeat each other. My, my point is that that concern is outdated also. That if you look like I showed you that the number of Arab uh, children, this gives you a sense of the number of births per year, and you can see that it's been about steady in the Arab sector, about 40,000 births every year. On the Jewish side, look at those numbers. Oh my gosh, it's going up from 90,000, now it's over 140,000. These are a little bit old, these data. So we have, if there was a demographic war, I'm not sure there was, but it certainly has been resolved, and isn't a time that all Israeli citizens, Jews and Arabs together, sit down together and talk about what we could do to uh, stabilize population and make this place a livable one for this because there are issues of carrying capacity in such a small country. And it didn't start today, it started in the Bible when uh, Lot and Abraham were arguing, their shepherds were arguing, they realized that they couldn't keep growing forever. Anybody who thinks that you can increase the number of sheep or the number of people in a finite planet infinitely well, we should probably, uh, they're either a mad person or an economist, as they say. So, so we really need to think these things kind of through because already we are starting to see that some of our most um, prized locations are full up and Israel's population is going to double. I have much more to say, but I think I've come to the end of my time. I said I talked for 25 minutes and we are there. So um, what I'd like to do now is maybe entertain questions. Uh, hopefully I've been there. I have a lot to say about what Israel could and should do, but first maybe we can get some responses. Um, happy to answer questions or um, hear alternative views that anybody should have. So let's open it up now to a discussion. 